Hello and welcome to this webinar. Tonight we will be talking about landlording and essentially we're, we're not going to talk about one specific topic but you get to control you get to control the actual topics that we're going to discuss because it's a Q&A session so also known as ask me anything. So let's roll through this. First and foremost who am I? Why should you care? Why are you listening? I'm Lucas Hall. I'm, I'm the founder of Landlordology. I'm also a landlord of over 10 years. I have uh, three properties in five states with about 17 or 18 tenants at any given point, and I love teaching. Uh, I love teaching people how to do things better, and I don't uh, say I know it all, but I definitely have some um, great stories and experience to share, and that's why we do this. So this is free. Uh, this webinar is completely free, and it's uh, hosted by Cozy. So uh, I also am the head of industry relations at Cozy, and I help with uh, general oversight of the product, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, but lastly, and arguably the most importantly, I am not an attorney. So please know that uh, anything I say here is not legal advice, and if you're looking for legal advice, I can't help you because I'm not a licensed attorney. But what I can tell you is that uh, I can give you the best practices and the industry standards and how to do things uh, the way I would do things um, to stay out of trouble and to run a better business. So. Uh, there's a lot of valuable information there, and I'm happy to share that. So I also have, um, oh, here's Landlordology. So this is the website that I founded, but is now part of Cozy. It's our content education division, and we basically teach you how to be better uh, through content and, and uh, guides and through uh, bringing information up into the surface that's easy to find. <clears throat> Excuse me. So go on there, check it out. It's all free. You can browse through. You can download whatever you want, and uh, arguably the most important or the most popular thing there is our state laws and regulations pages and so you can go through and look and find your state uh, state landlord tenant laws and just browse through them in an easy to understand format so we've we've summarized it and broken it down into non legalese and, and tried to explain it to you with links to the actual statute so that you can go read the the actual code for yourself if you want to so you don't have to take our word for it but you can see it so go check that out. Uh, I highly encourage you to do that even as we're talking tonight and maybe it'll stir up some questions. I also have Maggie Cooper here. So Maggie, if you get a chance, go ahead and turn on the camera and say hi. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Maggie. Thank you for having me, Lucas. Um, I will be helping out with the question portion of today's webinar. Um, so I will be reading Lucas your questions, translating them, getting that all handled in a good orderly way. Um, and I work at Cozy, I'm a customer success manager here. Um, so chances are, if you've signed up for a Cozy account, you'll get an email from me welcoming you and asking if you have questions. Um, I also host a weekly webinar on Cozy. So if you have Cozy questions, um, we also do these on Wednesdays. Um, we have the, this morning's at 11 o'clock, but we'll do another one next week. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about Cozy, uh, we also have resources to help you there. Um, so thanks, Lucas. Yeah, you're welcome, Maggie. That's awesome. And, and for those who have not ever attended Cozy's um, a demo that Maggie hosts, it's it's unbelievable. Like it, it, she'll walk you through the whole product. So uh, though the product is free, there is some time that you you know you need to take to uh, sign up and do all that. But she'll show you exactly what you'll experience if you were to do that. So um, I've actually done it a few times just to just to see what she does differently than I do. So it's a lot of fun and it's uh, real short and real easy and that's weekly. So check it out. All right, next. I'll tell you a little bit about Cozy. So this is just a brief synopsis of what we do here and how we're changing the lives of landlords and, and tenants nationwide. So Cozy provides modern property management software. Uh, we do a couple core things. One, if you have a vacancy or you, you're going to have a vacancy or you're about to have a place that you're going to rent, um, we help you with the listing. So you will create a beautiful web page for you and you can upload as many pictures as you want, describe the property, and then we'll actually syndicate that to a variety of different sites where, where you can kind of cast the broadest net possible. Uh, you also have, will get a little share link that you can sh uh, share with anybody, whether you text that to them or put it on social media, and potentially get new applicants that way. And so uh, it's really easy for them to apply, for a potential tenant to apply. They just fill out the form. Um, and then while they're filling out that online application, you can require uh, online um, current reports and background checks with that application. And that's that's what I do to get my tenants. Uh, I actually have them pay for that directly. It's $39 and it includes a full credit report, a full background check, and it gets bundled together with their online application. So I never really have to worry about chasing down more information. It's all right there from the moment I get the bundle. And, uh, and they love it too because 
they don't have to give me a wad of cash to go take care of it. It's a soft inquiry. It's real easy. And uh, and then they get a copy too. So no more like sending them a copy of their credit report if you reject them because they've already got it. So it's, it's um, changed the way I do business and it actually helps me screen my tenants in about an hour or less, including you know reference phone calls, which is awesome. And then lastly, if you do find somebody who you want to rent a place to, you can actually roll them into online rent payments. So they get set up, you get set up, it's super easy. They can pay on any device. So they can pay you know, while hiking the Matterhorn in Switzerland if they want to uh, through their phone. And uh, they can pay with you know, bank transfers, like through ACH. They can pay rent through uh, credit cards or debit cards or prepaid cards. And they can set it up to be automatic or just for you know, single payments. Um, they can pay for utilities through, you know, if they owe it to you or, or other storage fees or parking fees or whatever you want. It, it's a great way for you to keep track of all of the finances on that lease. And, uh, and most importantly, the way I use it most is that I have, you know, one ledger and one account and all of the roommates that I have in one single house, they all pay under one lease. And so they each only have to pay their portion, which is nice. So, it, you know, it tracks all of that so they can pay only their sections, but then I get the whole thing. So... Um, it makes paying with roommates super easy, and my tenants actually really enjoy it and don't want to leave my property because of the way they're paying rent. So the best part is it is 100% free for you. So as a landlord or property manager, you don't have to pay for anything at Cozy or any of the core features at Cozy. We do make money. We make money on the screening reports and, and then other things like our, we have this product called Rent Estimates, which allow for you to go in and you'll get real market data of actual rent amounts in your neighborhood and then you can figure out if like you're charging enough, which is invaluable, right? Um, and we make some money on that too, but all those are extra. All the core fee, uh, services are completely free and uh, there's truly no fee to, to pay or collect rent. It's really awesome. So let me talk a little bit about these core things. And, and the idea is that uh, I'm gonna touch on some topics tonight and then I don't want to go into too much detail because I just kind of want them to, to jog your memory or think about uh, questions that you didn't know you had. And so I'm trying to stir up questions for you. So let's uh, let's go through the big things about being a landlord, right? Online rent collection. Uh, the key for online rent collection, why it's so invaluable, is that you don't have to deal with checks anymore, which is still the primary or dominant form of rent payment in this country. You don't have to deal with checks. They can be effortless and automatic, which is essential if you're going to collect rent on time. And then um, they do decrease the amount of late rent that you get because you eliminate all the hurdles that people have with paying rent. I mean, when I started, personally, when I started forcing my tenants to pay rent online, or I wrote it into the lease that this is how we're going to do it, um, which varies state by state, but I'm allowed to do it in my states, uh, I eliminated all my late rent. Like, I hadn't had a single late payment in years. So it's truly amazing, and then they are actually happy. So when I had a recent group trying to leave my place, they actually asked, hey, Lucas, do you know of any other landlord in this neighborhood who uses Cozy? And I said, well, yeah, I know a few, but I don't know if they have any vacancies. And they said, well, we, we don't want to stop using Cozy. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's, that's kind of a testimony to the product and the tenants are asking for it. So when you market your tenant or market your listings with Cozy, we, as I mentioned, we will create a beautiful website for you uh, where you can post pictures, you get a map attached to it, and, and then you can actually share all those listings with potential applicants. Uh, if you have multiple units, they can browse through multiple units and see, you know, if you have an apartment building and they might want a two-bedroom or three-bedroom or a corner unit, you can do that too. Uh, we'll automatically syndicate it out there to other partners, and then it will serve as your online application. So no more passing out paper applications and then storing social security numbers in a, in a locked safe, and you don't have to deal with all that hassle. And then the online applications themselves are, are amazing. I mean, I, I mentioned you can pay rent while hiking the Matterhorn. Well, I actually had a tenant uh, fill out an online application and submit a credit report and background check to my place in Virginia uh, while she was hiking the Matterhorn. I mean, she stopped to you know eat dinner with her group that was climbing this mountain and uh, and got an email saying like you know dear roommate like please apply because I really want to get this place. And then sure enough, she did it right there on her phone. So uh, that's a pretty uh, strong testimony to how powerful it can be because you can truly do it from anywhere. And I like to bundle their screening reports, like the credit report and background check with an online application, but you don't have to if you don't want to. Sometimes you just want to get a free application and then worry about screening later. 
Uh, these screening reports I mentioned, which I'll show you an example of these, they use soft inquiries. So that's so critical. If you know anything about the credit industry, whenever you go get a lease on a car or even like you sign up for the <laughs> Apple Care Plan and it's like a recurring fee, or not the Apple Care Plan, the iPhone trade-in program <laughs> for those of you who like that, uh, it's um, they'll do a credit check on you and it's a hard inquiry, So which means it will actually hurt your credit. Uh, every time you do it, your credit goes down a little bit or your credit score goes down a little bit and it affects your next ability to get any credit. But this doesn't. So Cozy doesn't hurt the tenant's credit report, which is a bonus in itself because they're like applying to multiple places sometimes. Uh, it's seamless and easy. Uh, the applicants pay Cozy directly for those reports and so you don't even have to shell out any money at all and or worry about collecting cash. Uh, and like I said earlier, it mitigates your storage requirements so you don't actually have to keep like you know, decades of applications with sensitive information in a locked file cabinet behind a locked door, you know, with, with site inspections and all this other stuff that you've typically had to do for the last 20 or 30 years. So it's all online and it's really accessible uh, to you. So keeping with this theme, uh, let's talk about the top 10 pain points that a landlord or property manager has. So these are things that kind of make you squirm, right? I mean, things are like, oh no, I've got to do that again. And uh, these things, uh, you know, we'll roll through, are, I, I want you to talk about these. So let's, let's talk about these topics, let's ask questions about these topics, let's go through the details uh, as much as I can without actually giving legal advice. So uh, the no top 10 pain points for a landlord or property manager is the loss of revenue or income or rent, meaning when you have a vacancy or when somebody just leaves and abandons a lease, like you're actually losing money and your mortgage company is not going to say, oh, that's okay, just don't pay mortgage this month. Like you still have to do that, which means you have less of a grocery budget or you have less of a, uh, less money to fix the roof or whatever. So that loss is, is by far the biggest pain point and that's something that I think we all fear every single month. It's like, well, okay, I pick good tenants, but are they going to stay good tenants? Uh, number two, eviction. Uh, if you've ever had to go through an eviction, it is not a nice process. Uh, no matter what city or state you're in, uh, it, it's riddled with hoops and can sometimes be expensive and you may not win. So uh, the, the process of going through the eviction, uh, uh, an eviction action through the court system. Uh, number three, stress. Uh, number three and four, stress on property management and your business and the stress on your personal life. Um, I manage, uh, one of my properties is actually my wife's property and I manage it for her because she can't handle the stress of, of uh, it in her personal life. It just, just, she just doesn't like it. So I do it for her and I love it, but you know, it's not for her. So, it, uh, but the stress of property management, you know, I've got a, a potential vacancy coming up in uh, two months and you know, I'm getting some interest, but you know, I'm nervous. I'm like, well, is this, you know, going to pull together and yeah, I've got 60 days, but yeah, it's, I'm nervous. <laughs> uh, number five, tenant turnover. Like, how do you handle them moving out and moving in? You know, all that process and everything that happens, whether it's repairs or cleaning or deposit, like security deposit deductions and what's right and what's wrong. You know, how do you handle that? Uh, other pain points, repairs. Those are big ones. And how do you set up the proper, um, the proper techniques or proper uh, uh, contacts to make things happen when things go wrong? Uh, number seven, uh, compliance with the laws. And so I, I did mention on Landlordology, there is a site or a page that's the state laws. And so you can go look at what your state laws actually are and see if you're in compliance with them. M many times it's actually not that you're intending to break the law, but it's more like, uh, hey, I've got this lease clause that isn't matching up with what the state says I should do. So, you know, I only gave uh, 12 hours notice when I really should have given three days. So that kind of stuff. Uh, number eight, adequate insurance. So some people don't ever don't even have insurance on their rental properties, and by law you're not required to have insurance. Uh, but if you do have a mortgage, I'm sure they would require it. So what does that look like? How do you make sure that you have enough insurance, uh, and even loss of rental income insurance, which is important, or umbrella insurance, which is something I have. Uh, how do you handle leases? How do you find a good lease? What's in a good lease? You know, how do you sign good leases? All that stuff. And then lastly, finances and taxes. How do you track? rent, how do you track fees, how do you track other things, and then how do you do your taxes uh, so that you get the most deductions possible and you don't have to pay as much. Uh, so those are my top 10 pain points that probably, I hope one or two of them, you know, uh, hit, hit with you and that you knew, you were like, oh yeah, I know what that's about. So let's talk about it. So 
let's roll into this. We have um, a whole almost 40 minutes or so uh, questions and opportunity for questions. So feel free to look on your right hand side and uh, and type in any question that you have. And again, I cannot give legal advice. So if you ask for legal advice, I can't do it. But uh, I will answer to the best of my ability. And uh, and Maggie Cooper from Cozy is going to help me with this. So, Maggie, do we have any questions? Yes, uh, we have a number rolling in. Uh, first question is from Frank. Um, he asks, how do you contract out the maintenance of your rentals? I understand building relationships with local handyman, electricians, et cetera, is the best way. However, if that fails, is there a company that you use to take care of maintenance requests from tenants? Yeah, good question. And there's okay. a follow-up. Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, is it possible to work with a property management company just for maintenance? Mm. Or how does that work? Yes. Yeah. So... Great questions. Okay, so what I do personally is I have a little black book of contractors. It's um, it's just a, it's not actually a book, but I have a list of people that I've built relationships with over the years, and, and they all came from referrals of other people that I knew and could trust. And I, I have, you know, about four solid handymen in, um, in the main area where my properties are. And I, I know I can trust them with like lockbox access. So uh, I do manage a couple properties from afar. So I have a lockbox on the property that's hidden from my tenants. But if I need to, the contractors have access to it. Now, um, I don't give that access to anybody. They have to be worthy of it. And I definitely know what's happening when, when it's happening. And I will change the combo every now and then. Uh, but um, if something happens, and I, I rely on my tenants to report issues, so if the roof, the, the roof is leaking, which actually just happened recently, uh, or other things, the toilet stopped up or whatever, I, I'll either tell them how to fix it themselves, which is always the first step. So I'll, I'll mention, go buy a plunger, or, or I'll walk them through how to uh, fix the um, circuit breaker if it flips or something. I'll walk them through that, but then if there's actually a repair, I'll send over one of my handymen if I'm not sure really what's going on with it, or if I know what's going on, then I'll, I'll just call the appropriate company. So I don't use a roofing company a lot, but I, I do have one that I like, so I'll call them. If I don't know who to call, then I will just uh, use my Angie's List account, uh, which I, I prefer Angie's List over Yelp, or um, there are some other good ones out there, but uh, Yelp's a little too broad and a little too unfiltered, but I like um, I like Angie's List because I'm able to get some good reviews. Uh, just one thing to note on Angie's List, uh, if you, are looking at the top ranking one, oftentimes those are paid spots. So just because they're ranked with 1,000 good reviews uh, and at the top doesn't mean that they're the best. It just means that they've paid to be at the top. So a little bias there, but, uh, and I'll send them over. So the way that works is I will coordinate with my tenant. So if I can't be there or don't wanna be there, I will tell my tenant, hey, thank you so much for, for you know reporting this to me. Uh, I've got a plumber who's willing to come out and deal with it. Um, you know, can you be there Tuesday at two o'clock? And I just say, hey, listen, I, you know, I don't really want to give them roaming access to the place, but, but if you're okay with that, I can do that. Uh, otherwise, just be there, like make sure you're there and let them in and oversee it. And the reason I like that is because they, they can see the plumber, the plumber can see them, they can talk. The plumber can always call me when he's there if he has questions, uh, and I will pay that plumber directly through you know a check that I mail or online payments or whatever, um, but then I, the tenant actually gets to see the work, and so then I will follow up with the tenant and say, uh, "Hey, listen, did did you fix you know did, was it fixed to your standards?" And then if not, then I'll call the plumber back up again. So that's typically how I handle it, which is uh, it works beautifully because the tenant's involved. They typically want to be involved if if somebody's walking around their house, and uh, I don't typically have to be there, so I can do it remotely. Um, if I don't have somebody that I, I want to use or I don't feel like I, I want to look for people all the time, then you can sign up for a home warranty program. And I, I actually buy home warranties on my uh, every new property that I buy. Not new, but new to me property. And so for the first year, I know, you know I, I may be in a different area or whatever, and I'll be able to call them. Now there's like American Home Shield and Old Republic and... Um, those are the two I've used, which have been okay. Uh, they've been good. I mean, they're, they're certainly expensive. But I, I suggest if you are looking into a home warranty program, don't buy the cheapest one possible because you, you'll get, you, you, you won't make your money back. Uh, oftentimes they, they won't fix things like fixtures. So if the sink is leaking or the sink faucet is leaking, that's not covered, which is silly because that's what happens the most. Um, but, you know, read the terms and conditions and you'll be fine. 
Uh, I'm sorry, was there the last part of that question? Um, about if you could hire a property manager. Oh, yeah. Got it. Just the property repairs. Got it. So a la carte services. Yeah. So yes, you can. Not all property managers want to do that, and they often won't advertise that. But if you go to one that's local and you you know just talk to them on the phone and say, listen, I really just need somebody who's going to oversee the process for me when I have an issue, and I'll give you you know hundred bucks every time that happens. Chances are they'll say yes because they know it doesn't happen a whole lot. Uh, but other times they'll just say, no, I'm sorry, you have to hire our whole suite of services if you want that part. You can't just have it a la carte. But, you know, it's case by case. Um, I like to, like as I mentioned, I like to make my tenants kind of responsible for that. And I will even put that in my lease and just say that they have to kind of be part of that process. <clears throat> so good question. Thank you very much. All right. Next question is from Pamela. Um, she has five rental properties that she has more to design. Should she move them into an LLC? Ooh, good question. Uh, that's that's actually a really good question for your um, for a corporate attorney or, or someone who specializes in corporate formations or a, a tax attorney if that's your purpose is to mitigate taxes. Um, a lot of times people want to do this for liability reasons and they think like, oh, if I get sued, then you know if it's an LLC, it won't matter. Well, not always. So that's the general understanding, and it can work that way, but most of the time it doesn't. So uh, if you have mortgages on the property, uh, good luck, right? Because it's going to be tough to get those in an LLC. If you've bought them on a personal note with a mortgage, uh, then that mortgage company by contract is requiring you to be personally liable. And if you take the title and you put it in an LLC, then you are no longer personally liable or, or you actually don't own that property anymore. So you're taking the collateral away from the bank and you're saying, you don't have access to it anymore. So, and they don't like that because if they need to foreclose on you, then they can't because now the property is in an LLC. So they've actually required, you know, most mortgages require that you don't do that. And if you do, what that triggers is a due on sale clause. So technically the title gets transferred from you to the LLC and that's considered a sale. And uh, then you'll, you'll likely get a letter in the mail from the mortgage company you know, within 30 days of you doing that, and they say, hey, listen, you've got 30 days to pay the mortgage in full, and uh, that's never a nice letter to get. So if that happens to you, you better scramble back down to the the uh, the um, the main office for the, the county, the county clerk's office, and then transfer it back and then show proof of that. So if you have a mortgage, it's not a good idea unless you clear it with your mortgage company first, but if you don't have a mortgage, then you're free to do that, uh, just know that if a tenant wants to sue you, they can sue you on a number of levels. They can sue you as the owner. They can sue you as the property manager. Uh, they can sue you as the debt holder. Like if you're involved in any way possible with that property, they can sue you personally. So yeah, it provides some protection, but a savvy tenant is going to figure out a way around it. So it's not a it's not a hundred percent protection. Uh, what I do personally, uh, because I have mortgages, I can't transfer to an LLC. Um, I actually just have an umbrella insurance uh, policy. So uh, they have these things called umbrella policies. What it does is it sits on uh, as an umbrella over all of my properties, and it's like for a million dollars or two million dollars, you have a variety of different options. And then if I exceed the limits of the home insurance policy for a property, like if I get sued because someone broke their neck down the stairs, uh, then that that two million dollar umbrella policy will kick in and cover me. So. Instead of trying to prevent lawsuits, I just find a way to insure them, and that's that's the way I handle it. That's a lot, um, a lot easier and cheaper, to be honest, uh, and more effective sometimes. So thanks for the question. Good one. Uh, next question is from Sheila. Uh, she asks, in California, what are the best ways to collect past due rents after a tenant has moved out? Okay. Yes, past due rent. So first and foremost, you need to go get a judgment for it. So you don't really have much of an arm to, or a leg to stand on if you, I guess people aren't standing on their arms, but if you, a leg to stand on if you don't have a judgment. So you have to go to small claims court. It, it, it probably will be small claims court, depending on how much you're suing them for. But uh, after they've moved out, so it's not an eviction case, right? They're already gone. You just want to collect that debt. So go file a small claims suit. Try to win that judgment. You know, Maybe they won't even show up, or maybe they'll just show up and lose. And uh, once you have that judgment, then you can ask for a court order to garnish their wages. So if they have a real job, right, 
or I should say a salary job where there's a regular income that's set, then uh, then you can take that judgment and the employer will actually pay you first and then pay the tenant second when uh, when it's time when their paycheck comes around. Now, if they don't have a regular job or they they're working, you know, not that construction's bad, but it, sometimes there's like cash under the table when they're digging ditches, uh, and and you don't have access to that employer payment stub or anything, then uh, then it's a little more difficult. So the other method you could do is contact the IRS. The IRS actually has a web page for this. You can go to the and and learn about it. And typically, I think for two months out of the year, I, I don't know if it's like September, or October. Not sure, but two months out of the year, you have the ability to file this judgment or, or this court order and, and tell the IRS about it. And then what that says is they'll keep that and say, okay, well, if they are going to have any sort of a tax refund the, that following year, then the IRS will actually pay you first and then give the rest of the refund to the tenant. So that's that's a bigger hassle, but it's effective if you can do it according to the rules of the IRS. Uh, those are the two ways that I know how to do it. I, I honestly don't trust or respect um, credit uh, collection agencies because they will settle for pennies on the dollar and they won't get your money and they'll actually charge you for it a lot of times. So, uh, and, and it's just not that effective. So, a lot of hassle and, and it's hard to collect money from somebody who doesn't have anything. So, that's what I would suggest, those two methods. Uh, in California, I know they have a lot more rules about that, so you certainly would want to talk to somebody in the legal department <laughs> before you pursue or go down in a, big, you know, a small claims case. All right, next question is from Frank. Um, he asks, how do you deal with screening tenants that claim they have a service dog? Mm. If that property is listed as no pets, allowed, or only cats, are you legally obligated to allow service dogs in a rental? Great question. So <laughs> this is probably the most... Um, most misunderstood section of being a landlord. Yes, so there's something um, called protected classes. And what that means is there are people that fit into these protected classes and you cannot discriminate against them. And there are, uh, federally, there are seven protected classes. Um, I don't have them up on the screen, uh, but uh, they're the big ones, uh, like age, um, uh, I just had these, um, nationality, uh, for most states, yeah, you know what, let me just find them. Um, but what I will say, as I'll continue, is that uh, you cannot discriminate against those, and when that comes to service dogs and companion animals, those are difficult. So service dogs, let's define that, right? A service dog is anything, or I shouldn't say dog, service animal is anything that's gone through training that has actually uh, uh, helps that person live a normal life or live a life with their disability, right, that they would normally live if they didn't have it. So we as landlords and property owners, we have to allow them that that um, access to living that normal life. And what that means is that dog or that, you know, I've seen service horses or, you know, miniature horses or service, whatever the animal is, um, if, that, if that animal helps them achieve uh, and overcoming that disability, you have to allow that. And so uh, you cannot refuse them. That animal is actually an extension of them. It's like their arm or their leg. It is part of them. You cannot separate it. And that animal is not a pet. It's very clear that, that, uh, that, that the government says that it's not a pet and you cannot discriminate on it. It's, it's almost as if it were a person. So you have to treat it that way. Now, there's a difference between service animals and companion animals. So service animals are animals that are highly trained uh, they typically go through a huge regiment and then have some sort of certificate to prove it, right? And they, they are for a specific reason. Now, companion animals, that's where it gets wishy-washy, right? Um, if anybody ever showed me a, a certificate that this is a service dog, I mean, that that's the end of the, you know, that, that there's no question, okay, fine, they're just like a child or, or, or extension of you, like, it's fine. But companion animals, that's... That's where they can go online and say, I love my pet, uh, you know, chinchilla, and he's a companion animal and I can't live without him. And then some goofy website prints out like a companion animal certificate, and then you think, oh, I've got to do this. Not so much. So that's where it gets uh, weird. So 
yes, there are people with mental disabilities that are hard to prove and or, or they're dealing with post-traumatic stress or it's a short-term deal. Maybe, they, maybe they're dealing with something that affects their life. And if it affects their ability to enjoy or access the property, then you need to help them, okay? And so that means, um, you know, and let's just use classic examples. Let's say somebody's in a wheelchair and has trouble going up steps. You have to allow them to install some sort of ramp. Now, they, um, uh, they typically have to pay for that, so you don't have to pay for that, and they have to return it to the condition when they leave. Well, if let's say they have issues with uh, their emotions and they're stressed out all the time because they came back from Iraq and they're, they're dealing with it and their companion animal helps them deal with that, then that helps them live a, na a normal life, and that's okay. Now, you are allowed to say, like, can you prove it, right? I mean, can you show me some something that proves that you have this disability, even if it's just a short-term disability, and that this animal is necessary for that? So that's where it gets a little wishy-washy because they, they will oftentimes either write up some sort of handwritten note from a doctor, a doctor, or their friend, or whatever, and they just say it's companion, or they will even say this, and I've heard this before, they'll say, you're not allowed to ask me what my disability is. That's private information, and that's not true. So I've never seen a law that says that you can't ask. So you don't have to take their word on it is what I'm saying. So when they say this is a companion animal and you can't, you know, you can't ask me any more than that, you just have to take it at face value, that's not true. So uh, tell them I need a doctor's note. And I would even go as far as to say if you're concerned about it, tell them I need a doctor's note from a doctor in the state, not, not an online doctor who's never actually seen you. Uh, so that's what I would suggest. Get them to prove it. And, uh, but if they do produce a doctor's note for a companion animal, something that helps them emotionally, then I wouldn't argue it. I would just roll with it. Even if you think it's fishy and you think they might be lying to you, you know, that's tough because uh, while the law says that you don't actually, you know, you're allowed to make them prove it, uh, I've never seen a court case where the landlord actually won <laughs> that because the courts will always side in favor of the disabled tenant. Uh, so anyway. Uh, that was a long ramble. I'm so sorry. But uh, what I will say is, um, Maggie, in that little spreadsheet, there's a link there. What is that link? It's like animallaw.info. Let's see. Where is it here? Let's see here. Uh, maybe I have it. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Animallaw.info. Yeah. So this this is a site that I go to a lot. I'm going to pull this up um, when I'm looking at companion stuff because it actually has a decent amount of links to the actual laws themselves. So... Uh, check it out. There's there's a lot of stuff here in legal topics. Animallaw.info. Okay. Thanks. That was a long question. Next. All right. Next question. Um, this is from Shelly. She has to write her tenant a letter because they have been late on rent for the last couple of years, and she's planning on raising rent. Okay. So what are your tips for handling this situation so it's as smooth as possible? Okay, so if, if you have the opportunity to raise rent and you think you should, and it's at the end of the lease or month to month, then um, the best way would just be simply, uh, well, what I like to do is I actually, I actually like to have a phone call with them. So if you have a, a relationship with that tenant, then that's the best way to approach it because then they can ask questions. Um, but if you, if you are uncomfortable with that interaction, then just simply write up a short little letter. You don't actually have to uh, give them a reason why. So you are allowed to raise the rent if, if it's the end of the lease or it's month to month. Now, make sure you know your state laws. So some states require that you only, you know, you can only raise it 5% or 3% or 10%. So make sure you're within that limit. But, uh, but other than that, you can just say, hey, listen, as of this date, the rent is now whatever. Uh, you never have to say, you know, it's because I had to replace the roof or because my taxes went up or all this other stuff. It's just, it doesn't matter to the tenant. They don't care why you're raising the rent. Uh, so you don't have to explain it. There's no law for that. Did I answer that question? All yeah, I think okay, that cool. good. Thanks for it. All right. Um, we have a couple questions about Cozy, and I'm going to condense them into okay. groups, uh, one on rent collection and one on screening. Um, so we have Shelly and Stan ask about how to take your existing tenant and introduce them to Cozy, Okay. Um, and also what to do if you have um, a late fee you want to add through Cozy. Uh, I see. 
Okay, so the best way to introduce a tenant into Cozy is actually from the very beginning. And so there's, you can do it at any stage, but the way I like to do it is I use Cozy for my online applications. So when I have somebody interested, I give them the link to apply, and they actually get set up in Cozy that way. And then once they're set up and they have an account, the rest of it's super easy. So they're already familiar with the site. They know the URL. They, they get email notifications that, hey, your lease is you know, starting and that you can set up payments. So it's very seamless. Uh, and I've never had any issues that way. But if you already have existing tenants or, or you didn't use Cozy for screening, you can do that too through Cozy. You, you can do payments through Cozy easily as well. So you just tell us about your lease, you know, the, the dates that rent's due, what the rent amount is, if there's deposits, things like that and then add in the renter's email address. And then when you do that, it will trigger an email and it, and it will walk them through the whole process. So it's like, hey, guess what? Your landlord's using Cozy, like let's get set up. And, it, and Cozy walks them through that. Uh, if, they are, um, if they're special and they need a little extra help, uh, then I will actually do this with them, but it's, it's unnecessary. I've had that happen once. So, most of my tenants can get set up on their mobile phone in a matter of three or four minutes. It's really that easy. Um, and that's, that's just the beauty of online rent payments. Um, what was the second question? Um, how to add a late fee through Cozy. Gotcha, yes. So Cozy lets you set up online rent payments and that transaction happens regularly or and that charge happens automatically. But if you have a late payment uh, or if you have other fees like, uh, like pet fees or storage unit fees or parking fees, you can just go into Cozy, hit, uh, you know, add a charge and document what it's for. Like I had a charge I was for my tenants for some light bulbs that they didn't replace. And uh, I just put it in there and, and added the dollar amount. And then it gets assigned to the lease and then they can see that. They get an email and then they can actually, they're invited to pay directly right then and there. So they can make those one-off payments uh, very, very easily. So uh, I actually was playing... Um, Euchre. I don't know if anybody in the Midwest knows that game. I was playing Euchre with a, with one of my tenants, and she got the email that I had added a charge. That was a little <laughs> embarrassing because it's like I'm I'm beating her at Euchre and I'm taking her money. But uh, but she actually just stopped, did what she needed to do on her phone, and then paid it right then and there because her payment information was already added to Cozy from before. So very easy, uh, and I'll never go back to the old way. Awesome. Uh, here's a question from Diana. Uh, she asks, uh, typically rents are due on the first with the exception of weekends and holidays, right. correct? Um, is that federal holidays, bank holidays, or is rent due on the first regardless of the calendar? <laughs> Good question. So it's the latter. So um, nationally, there's no law about that. Uh, I've, I have seen in some counties they do state, or and even some states, very few though, uh, state that like, hey, if there's a holiday, you have to go the next day. Uh, that's not something that happens, really. I mean, that's not something that even the states want to regulate. Uh, the only, you know, the, the confusion is that the IRS treats it that way. So the IRS, when your taxes are due, it's like, well, if the, you know, if the 15th is on a holiday or a weekend, then you, it's really due the next, you know, business day. And in this case, it was the 18th this year, you know, in April 18th. So. Uh, that's where they get confused, and they think, oh, it must work like the IRS, and that's not true. You're not a government entity. You don't, you don't force, you know, buy, there's no law about paying rent necessarily uh, to you like there is paying taxes to the government. So uh, it's, it's not the same. So if rent is due on the first, look at it this way. They have the entire month to pay rent. There is no reason why they have to wait until the last possible second to do it. And if you're still collecting rent checks and they're still dropping them in the mail, that's a little bit on you because you're choosing a, a more complicated, older way to do it and you still have to deal with the postal service, but it's also on them. So they, they don't have to wait until Friday night at eight o'clock, you know, and, and on the 31st and rent's due on the first, you know, there's nothing in there that says, oh, I got it stamped by the post office or I dropped it in the mail, now it's the post office's fault. Well, no. They had all month. It's their fault. Uh, rent should be received. Now, with online rent payments, if you get a, an email, so like when they when they log in to pay rent and they they trigger it or it goes, that's when rent is considered paid. So it, the assumption is it is going to process, just like when you go to pay it or deposit a check, you're assuming it's going to go through, and and most time it does. But uh, you credit their account 
the moment they hand you the money, like when they give you a check, right? You don't know if that check's been clear, but you're crediting them kind of, It's the same way with online rent payments. So rent's always due on the first, if that's what's in your lease, and uh, you don't have to accommodate them for weekends and holidays. Awesome. We have two questions. Um, well, they're the same question, so I'm going to group them. Okay. Uh, you mentioned umbrella insurance. Uh, can you elaborate on what kind of insurance you recommend and talk a sure. little bit more about your insurance that you use? Okay, sure. So I have Allstate for all my properties. I, I've just been with them for a long time. I bundle it with my car insurance, uh, and they offer a plethora of products. So I like Allstate, but you know, they may not be the cheapest for you. It just depends on your, your property and they may not be the best for you. So try it out. You know, USA is another good company. Navy Federal Credit Union is also great for this kind of stuff. So uh, what, I, what I love about umbrella insurance is basically I have home insurance policies on every single one of my properties, all my rentals and my, private, my personal residence. But um, usually that's like liability up to $300,000 or so. But what if I get sued and I now lose a court case and I have to pay a million dollars? Well, my home insurance co would cover 300 because that's the liability coverage, but then I'm on the hook for the other $700,000 and I don't have $700,000. So then the tenant could go and they could sue me to collect on that and I could potentially be forced to liquidate assets or sell other properties or they could come take some of that away, you know, if, depending on how far they want to take it. And I don't want that to happen. So that's why I have an additional policy called an umbrella policy, and it kind of sits over and above all my properties and covers my entire portfolio. So if, you know, house A, if I have a lawsuit on that one, it'll kick in. But then two years later, if I have a huge lawsuit on house B, it'll kick in too. So uh, typical coverage amounts are like a million dollars or $2 million or $5 million. Uh, and it's really the biggest thing they cover is just like – big lawsuits, and those are the ones that will devastate you, so that's the thing you really need the, the coverage for. Uh, ideally, you never have to use it. If you do have a claim because a tree fell in your house, that, that's where your home insurance would kick in to fix it, uh, but, you know, it, it covers above and beyond. The nice thing is, too, it also covers, you know, if you have a bundled car policy, it'll cover that, too. So if I'm driving down the road and I have $100,000 worth of liability coverage, and I run into, uh, you know, a, a McLaren or a, um, uh, you know, Lamborghini or something, and it's like a $300,000 car, and I total it, that's where the umbrella insurance would actually come in and cover that too. So um, that's what I recommend. Go check it out. It's usually only between three and $500 a year, so it's pretty cheap relatively, to, you know, cheaper than even creating businesses sometimes. Awesome. Yeah, All sure. right, next question is from Kristen. Okay. Um, she says, we have a property with four unrelated individuals on the lease. They want to renew, but one person is leaving and they will get a new roommate. The tenant leaving has a pet. We have a pet addendum on the lease. What is the best way to handle renewing the lease in the security deposit? Um, and then there's a follow-up question. Also, can we ask them to clean the carpets even though most of them are staying since the original lease says they are responsible for cleaning carpets at the end of the lease? Good question. So uh, I'm actually dealing with something very similar right now. I have, I have uh, six roommates in a house and one of them's leaving and the, rest, the other five are renewing. Um, so if you want to execute some of those lease clauses, like if your lease says they have to clean the carpet, then um, if you want to do that now instead of next year when the renewal is up, then I would actually suggest that you just um, don't do a renewal, but just do a new lease. So you have two options, right? You can tell them, hey, listen, we're going to sign a one-page addendum that just renews the date, right? It just changes the date when the lease is over. And then you can also include, like, and Bobby's leaving, you know, that kind of stuff. And it's really a simple document. It's one page. They all sign it. Uh, that's one option. The other option is just to let the lease expire, but in the meantime, have up a whole new document that's a full lease with the full information and only the people who are going to be signing it. So forget about Bobby, his lease will expire, and uh, and just sign a brand new lease with new clauses in there. So if you don't want the new lease to have uh, a pet allowance or a pet policy, then, then don't include that. So sometimes it is cleaner just to start fresh. Uh, but even if it is a renewal, you know, just tell them, hey, here's the new lease with the new terms, just sign it for another year. Um, that's what I would do in that situation, so that way technically the old lease is terminating and they have to oblige by those obligations. The downside is 
the deposit. Now, what do you do with it, right? So technically, if one lease is fully ending and a new one is fully starting, then you would have to give back the deposit minus repairs. So that requires you to do like a move out inspection. Even if they're all kind of staying there, you kind of look around and say, this is what the damage is and I'm going to fix it now and take from your deposit if you don't fix it. Um, so that can be a little more work, but it's cleaner. Um, if you want to just, if I'm going back to the renewal idea, if you want to just have Bobby or whatever his name is leave um, and they get a new roommate eventually, you can just sign the renewal with the existing tenants that are staying and say, we'll add in the new tenant when you find him, him or her, and uh, we'll add them through an addendum. Uh, and in that case, the new tenant would kind of pay Bobby his deposit back. So I, you wouldn't issue any funding because the lease is being renewal, you, you know, renewed. You wouldn't give back any money at all, and you would just tell Bobby, hey, if you want your money back, you got to get it from the new tenant. And that new tenant is now on the lease. So two options. It, it's up to you to choose which one you want to do, depending on your situation, but, but the, those are your options. So good question. All right, next question is from Priscilla. Uh, she asks, I wanted to know if you recommend showing the apartment while there is a current eviction happening. Hmm. <laughs> Good question. Ooh. I do recommend showing the apartment when you have a current tenant in there, but I've never, I've never thought about the eviction aspect of it. Uh, so that tenant that's living in your place that you are evicting is not going to be very happy with you. So it'll be extremely difficult for you to show a place that's clean and, um, and it, that the tenant has tried to make it a good experience for you. So they may actually just lock the doors. They may not want to let you in. They may, you know, talk bad about you if they happen to be there, and they may make your life miserable. So if you have that eviction, I, I, um, I strongly urge that you wait until it's finished. I know that's, that's a hard pill to swallow, but what happens if you are actually going to eviction court and you talk to the judge and, you know, you may think that you're in the right 100%, but for whatever reason the judge decides no, let's give this tenant another 30 days to get out, and you've already signed a new lease with a new tenant uh, that starts before that, and then you're kind of up a river, right? Then then you can't, um, or down a river, I suppose. Uh, then you can't, you, you now you have two contracts, and, and you can't do anything with it. So then you might be liable for that tenant's, you know, uh, fees or whatever it is because you're breaking the contract. So in cases of an eviction or when you think that you're going to have trouble getting a tenant out, don't sign a lease with a new tenant. Wait until it's over. All right. Thank you. Um, we have a couple questions that I'm going to combine. Okay. Uh, these are about recommended uh, lease contracts. Um, Pamela and Valencia have asked if you have a good sample of a lease that you go by or who okay. you'd recommend uh, uh, okay. for crafting a lease sure. template. And then Diana asks about does Landlordology have resources to find a real estate or a tax attorney? Good question. Okay. Yeah. So, yes. So, I don't have a lease I can share with you uh, because I can't give you legal documents, but what I can do is show you where you can find them. So uh, on Landlordology, there's a toolbox here, and you can look through our services directory. I'm going to click on that right now. And in that, you'll see here there's something called legal forms. And these are not, uh, th these are legal form providers. We don't have any share of their company. We don't get any money from them. This is simply because we think that they are the best ones out there. And I've actually screened all of them or used all of them at some point. So I like all of them. They all are priced differently. Uh, you can go through them. You, some of them even have a lease creator, so they walk you through the process. I know um, Easy Landlord Forms has a really great lease builder. Um, uh, NOLO is kind of an industry standard, but they don't have leases for all the states. So, you know, you kind of got to look around. So give them a shot. Look at all these. If you're looking for an actual uh, a lawyer or somebody to help you craft that, which I think is a good idea to have an attorney actually look at your lease when you've got it the way you want it to make sure that you're not breaking any rules. Uh, if you don't have a local attorney who knows your county laws, then you can probably find one on AVO, which is A-V-V-O. You can click here and, and look there, and you can search through their lawyer directory. Um, so that, that's a, the best way. If you don't have a lawyer, that's the best way to find one, I think. So give it a shot. All right. Um, we have a couple cozy questions I'm going to combine into one. Okay. Uh, Thomas and Nina have, a, have asked about cozy screening. Um, Thomas specifically is wondering if cozy is compliant in the state of California. He's noticed it's gotten very expensive in that state. Um, and Nina is asking 
if COSI screens uh, nationwide for background and criminal uh, fiction checks. Yes, so COSI, uh, there is a, a page here called COSI Tenant Screening. You can find out more information about it. And uh, it is compliant in every state in the fact that, uh, that the tenant pays for these reports. So where the laws are on the states is that typically they say a landlord or property manager can only collect a certain amount of money and it should be used for, for screening purposes like credit reports and background checks. But it, if you use COSI, you're never actually collecting any money. It's a payment and it's a transaction that happens between the tenant and, the, and us the, and COSI and we give them the report and it's shared with the landlord immediately, like at the same time they get it. So it, it is a, a product that they are buying on their own. That, you know, at your request, they're buying it to get your place, but they're buying on their own. So it's not something that you're doing on their behalf. So, um, and, and it is less than the amount, um, you know, regulated in California, but that's beside the point. It wouldn't matter if it was more or not. Um, Anyway, but yeah, that's how you can do it. And and what happens is they actually fill out all the information. They get a copy of it. If you want to see what it looks like, I'll show you a sample here uh, of both the credit report and background check. So you can see it looks a whole lot better than what you'll often see through other providers. I mean, we, we spent a lot of time and money making sure this was easy to read and easy to understand. So this is an example of a credit report you'd purchase through Cozy or you would get through Cozy. It shows you what uh, the overall credit score is for that tenant. Uh, and as you can see, this is going to be a full report. It's not just a recommendation, which I think are horrible, horrible things, because um, it doesn't actually give you the reasons why they're saying this. So anyway, uh, it tells you about the number or the amount of credit used, what their monthly payments are going towards, which is helpful. Uh, but my favorite part about this whole report is just something that people uh, oversee or they don't get in other reports, but it's the total debt and how it's divided up. So I want to know personally, you know, in this case, they have $202,000 in debt. Like, I want to know if that's mostly debt on a mortgage, or is that, like, a debt from a hospital because they were in a car accident, or is that, you know, $138,000 in, like, pants at the Gap? You know, I, I just, I need to know what type of debt it is because it really does matter. Uh, hands down, I would take somebody with $300,000 in uh, mortgage debt over somebody with $3,000 in credit card debt. So three thousand dollars is not much in the realm of you know in, in our consumer base now. I mean, a lot of people have three thousand dollars in debt, but that is worse to me than three hundred thousand dollars in mortgage debt. Uh, then it goes on to tell you if there's any accounts that have ever been laid or if there's any public records showing up on the credit report. Uh, it'll go through every single line item or every installment account, like every credit card or every mortgage, and give you a two-year history. So it'll tell you if they've ever been late for the last two years what the balance is, what they owe, and then it'll even go through and say who else has inquired. So sometimes you'll see other screening companies on there because they've applied at the apartment down the street. That's kind of interesting. If they say they haven't applied anywhere else, and then all of a sudden you see two other recent inquiries, it's like, well, they lied to you because they're, they're hedging their bets. They're going to pick one place. Um, and it'll show you previous addresses, which is great in case it doesn't match up with where they say they're living. Uh, and then even employment opportunities or, or where they've lived in the past. So this is a really detailed, great report, easy to read. Uh, it doesn't look like a fax machine spit it out from 1972, mm -hmm. uh, which is usually the case for credit reports. Uh, and then going on to the background check, here's an example of what you would see. This is a, a clean background check and a, and a uh, one that had a hit on it. So if you're doing a background check through Cozy, you'll get uh, not only a Social Security verification, but it'll do an eviction search. It'll do a sex offender search, terrorist watch list, and then it will search national and county uh, criminal records uh, for those counties who do offer criminal records online. Uh, in some cases, you know, it may take a few days if the county that you're searching in is not up to date and they literally, like, you know, Martha is in the back of the file cabinet room, like, looking through <laughs> things. That, that takes a couple days. But other than that, it's, it's usually pretty instant and it comes back. So you can see here, uh, Buster Bluth is all clear and he'd be like a great tenant, but then George Michael Bluth, um, you know, he had an arson charge in Orange County, California that showed up and so I probably wouldn't rent him because he'd probably burn down my banana stand. <laughs> so uh, that's it. I think I answered that question. Yeah, great. So let's move on. All right, um, AJ has asked, um, he's having trouble uh, list or renting his studio apartment. It's an open layout plan, essentially just one big room okay. furnished. Um, 
Do you have any suggestions for someone who's having trouble renting their rental? Yeah, so there's only um, really a few reasons why you would have trouble renting a place. So the three factors that affect your ability to rent it are um, price, condition, and your ability to market it. So if consider it like a triangle, right? So if your price is too high, then you're not going to get anybody interested. If you're not marketing it correctly, so if you don't have great pictures online on all your ads or uh, you're not writing a good enough ad or you're not highlighting it or you're not putting it in enough places, then people aren't going to see it or they're going to think it's not a great place. So you really have to have a pristine, high-quality ad with really great photos. Uh, and then uh, the last place is condition or the last factor is condition. So if people are inquiring and they're showing up and, but the place stinks or not that yours does, but if, it, if it's got an odor to it or it's dark or it's dirty or, or it could just be raining that day and that sometimes affects price, you know, um, that will affect it too. So if, if you're not getting any inquiries at all, then, uh, then I think your price is too high or your ad is not good enough. And so work on those things. Uh, unfortunately, if you, if, you know, sometimes you have a certain amount you need to get and unfortunately sometimes that doesn't always happen. Um, but if you are getting inquiries, then work on the showmanship of the property. Like make sure that it looks nice when people show up and time it properly. So. Uh, if you're not sure what to charge, you can actually use a product that we have here at Cozy. It's called our Rent Estimate Reports. Uh, and what it does is uh, for $19.99, you'll actually get a full detailed property report um, that matches up what other people in your area are getting for rent. And we're able to get that information um, pretty accurate. And uh, and I, I've talked to lots of landlords who actually say, oh, like I got this report and it cost me 20 bucks, but I was able to raise my rent $100 a month. So it, it paid for itself in you know in two weeks or less. So um, you can do that, see how it compares to what you're getting, and if it's a lot lower, then maybe you should lower it. So thanks. All right. Um, we have had a couple questions about uh, working with agents and property managers. Okay. Um, Lee asks, uh, for listing a rental property, is it better to hire an agent? Um, how could we find one uh, that would provide good value? And is getting into the ML... MLS only through a realtor. Uh, and then Patrick asks about how he's having a hard time finding a pro competent property manager mm. um, and ways for finding a good property manager that he could work with. Yeah, so a couple of good questions. So really the question is, should I hire a property manager, period. And uh, m my personal opinion is that I think property managers are worth their weight in gold if you find a good one. If you... <laughs> The problem is that it's hard to find a good one. So the ones that are truly care about and are passionate about their business and helping you and serving you and the property, then they're amazing. The ones that uh, are just doing property management on the side because they, their real estate business isn't taking off, those are the ones you want to avoid because they are struggling to make sales and they're like, well, I'll just manage properties because it, it pays the bills. No, they're, they have no, they're not going to be in your best interest. So, um, one, to answer the first question, you do not need a property manager to list your property. There are lots of sites like Cozy who will syndicate your listing, they'll help you make a beautiful listing, and put it out there for, for people to see. You can also use tools like Zillow. Zillow has a, a rental manager that also syndicates it out. So between Cozy, Craigslist, and Zillow, you'll hit every renter that you could possibly want to see the place. Then the, the um, the listing agent or the real estate agent isn't going to be able to do any better than that. Now, the MLS uh, is a private, uh, you know, listing service that real estate agents and property managers have access to, and you have access to it through Cozy. Actually, if you were to create a Cozy listing, we'll syndicate it to Realtor.com, where is where all the MLS stuff's pulling up. So, I personally also don't like getting um, calls from real estate agents who have found my place on the MLS because they, one, expect me as a landlord to pay one month of rent to them as a finder's fee, and then two, uh, the other rentals I find on the MLS are usually put there by agents, and they often will price things too low so that they can make a quick transaction. Like, it, they don't make any money unless they make a transaction, so it's in their best interest to price it low and get action on it rather than actually price it competitively. So, I, I don't like that. Uh, so, no, you don't need a property manager, but if you don't want to do it, then you certainly need to hire somebody to do it for you. Awesome. Good question. Um, do you have 
any advice for or warnings for marketing longer term furnished rentals? Mm. Um, she also yeah. doesn't say an HOA clause prohibits short term leases like Airbnbs, executive housing, anything under two months. Okay, so there's, there's two parts there. I love long term rentals, period. Uh, you'll make more money with short term rentals, but they're much more complicated and, you, and they're kind of a hassle. So you would need help if you're not local and you don't want to do it yourself. You would need help with short term rentals. But for long term rentals, you can get that lease set up for a year and then you don't really have to think about it much unless there's a repair needed. Now, uh, when it comes to furnishing, that's a great way to increase the rent price. So people sometimes will want like the conveniences. They don't want to have to pick out furniture. They don't want to have to deal with it. They, they know they're only in town for like nine months or a year and it's just that they've got the suitcase on their back or the, the backpack on their back and they just need a place. So you can certainly do that. So if your place is already set up for like short term rentals but you're not allowed to do it, then explore long term options. And, and the suggestions that I have are to explore um, possible providers of tenants. So see if there's like a nursing company or a hospital nearby that has traveling nurses. That's always a, a good thing. That happens a lot and they'll be in town for like five or six months. Uh, sometimes um, doctors, you know, traveling doctors who are learning a new trade, they'll come to a hospital and they'll learn. Uh, universities too will often need placement for teachers or even for their students sometimes. And so you'll, you'll be able to get sometimes a, a pipeline of people that way. Uh, there's also a number of corporate websites, and I would just search for sh corporate housing online um, that work with businesses, like large corporations, to put their people places. Uh, sometimes airlines need to put, put people up for long term, not just nightly stuff. So, you know, explore those options. Consider, like, what am I near? So if you're near a university, near a hospital, go, go talk to them. Talk to their HR department. And go see, like, hey, you know, I've got a place. It, you know, do you want to work something out? And they'll actually pay you to put their people there. So uh, the lease can be, you know, a year, and they'll put like five people in over the course of the year. So it can be a steady stream of income, and that's a great way to do it. Otherwise, you're just left to advertise like like everybody else for your long-term rental. So hope that answers your question. All right. Next question is from Corey. Um, is it best to include utilities in the rent or keep them in your name? And, sorry, is it best to include utilities in the rent and keep them in your name, or is it better to have the renter put the utilities in their name? Uh, okay, uh, good question. So with all my single-family homes, I do require the tenant put their name on the utilities. I ask them to sign up for it. Now, the water bill or the water company is not going to be um, not going to let you take your name off, but they will add somebody else as well as as a co-occupant. Um, that's only because you're legally responsible to pay the water if um, if they don't pay. Now, with the electric bill and cable and all that stuff, then you're not on the hook like you are with the water bill. That's just kind of a, a national law, I suppose, or it's done everywhere that way. But uh, single family homes, make them sign up for it. You, know, like, you don't want to be in the business of dealing with that and, and messing around with it if you don't have to. Now, if you have a multifamily property, like an apartment complex, and it's not sub-metered, then you certainly are on the hook. Like You have to manage that bill, and you have to pass it on to them. Uh, you have a couple options. One is you can just say, I'm going to divide up the utilities, and some counties do require you to do this. But you divide up the utilities, and you you basically allocate it by square footage, which is typically the most fair, and then you bill them for it. So you can use Cozy for that. If you figure out that you know Unit A has a $78 electric or power bill this month, you just add in a $78 charge, and then they pay it back to you. Now the other way I, I like to do it when I'm advertising is I I don't ever include you know utilities included with the rent. Uh, why? Well, because then it makes my place look a lot more expensive than the one down the street. And so while I may have the same square footage as somebody down the street, my place might be $100, $200 more expensive, and then therefore the tenant or a potential tenant is going to go look at the other place first. I don't want that. I want my rent price to look as cheap as possible. And then, you know, most people assume that they're going to have to pay utilities anyway, and so that's an added fee that they've got in their head. So why not just kind of fit that nomenclature and say, here's rent, and then the fee is X, Y, or Z. And I sometimes will even do a flat fee. So I'll work that out, and I'll say, listen, I can't let you manage utilities, but for $200 a month, you have unlimited access to it, and we won't even regulate it. And I'll, that's just your utility fee or your convenience fee or whatever you want to call it. Um, but check your state laws or, or actually your county laws to make sure that that's okay. All right. Um, here are a couple more cozy questions. Okay. 
Um, Stan asks about Cozy in Spanish, um, and then um, Juan also asks about HOA through Cozy. Okay. Um, so can you talk a little bit about sure. how those would work? Cozy in Spanish. So yeah. uh, Cozy, so in the language in Spanish, uh, there's no translation button built into Cozy, but all browsers or most browsers have some sort of translation automatically. So um, while the emails that get sent out are going to be in Spanish or in French or any other language other than English, but uh, chances are good if somebody doesn't speak English and they're in here in America and they're working, renting, you know, uh, U.S. housing, they probably have something that helps them translate, so they'll be able to figure it out. Uh, it's not been a question that comes up a lot, and we, we deal with hundreds of thousands of tenants um, on a, every month, so it's not that it's not something that it seems to be a huge issue because they can translate it just like they translate everything else. Um, now, I'm sorry, what was the second part? Um, um, HOAs, HOAs, right. Yeah. So uh, it can work for that. We've, we've actually have customers who are using Cozy for random different things, like uh, the rent is the obvious uh, big one, but sometimes landlords use it for boat docks, like collecting money rent for boat slips uh, for uh, shared desk space, like co-work space, like where they rent out just, you know, a little slot on a big table, and that's where you go work for the day. Um, we've seen people use it for storage facilities, storage units, uh, for parking lots. It, it'll work for a variety of things. Uh, the only caveat with when you use it for things like homeowners associations, uh, the, the wording is a little weird. So uh, it works perfectly. The money will transfer fine. Uh, but they will get emails that say, like, your landlord will want you to, you know, it's charged you rent. And so it's really not a landlord nor is it rent. It's, it's HOA dues and it's homeowners association. So uh, they just, you know, you'd have to kind of get over that nomenclature. But uh, other than that, it would work perfectly. So uh, give it a shot. Uh, the only thing we don't do that would probably be helpful for an HOA is to have, like, a document repository where you could store files and condo docs and all that stuff that they could access. But... Um, but we're working on those features, so um, hopefully it'll help you a little bit better in the future. All right. Um, here is a question from uh, Diana. How can we monitor if a tenant is honoring lease terms if we have to give 48-hour notice before entering the property? Okay. Isn't, wouldn't that give them time to cover things up? <laughs> yes, it certainly does. So by law, in most states, you are required to give proper notice. Now, that, the amount of time that is proper notice it varies from state to state. Sometimes it's 12 hours, sometimes it's two days or longer. So uh, it's just the way it is. I'm, I'm so sorry, but that's you know, it is unfortunate. Uh, if they are breaking the, the lease somehow, like the classic cases, they have a dog and there's no dogs allowed. Um, and you say, hey, listen, I'm coming by two days from now <laughs> for whatever reason to inspect the property to repair something, then uh, they will likely take that dog and hide him or put him at a friend's house or something. What you can do is just, um, without being snoopy or without invading their privacy, you know, and, and you do have a right to go over there and you do have the right to conduct business, uh, just keep an eye out. I mean, you, you can tell if there's dog hair in the corner because they didn't vacuum um, without actually snooping. Like, that's pretty easy to do. Or if there's a dog toy or chew toy laying on the floor, like, that's pretty easy, right? Um, but just you know, do your best. Uh, um, there's nothing you can do to get away away from the proper notice requirement. You have to do that. You do have to get proper notice, and if you don't, then you could get into big trouble if they wanted to push it. So uh, always get proper notice and just do your best at figuring out if they're breaking the lease or not. Awesome. Uh, so um, we also, I think we're running out of time here. It's like uh, 12 after when we said we'd be finished. So let's do like three more questions, and then we'll wrap it up. And uh, if, if I didn't answer your question, I'm so sorry. I, it looks like we had hundreds come in, and we only had an hour. So uh, if, if you really do want a question, feel free to email me or Maggie. My email address is lucas at landlordology.com uh, or Maggie, uh, Maggie C at cozy.co. Yeah, so, email me for cozy questions. I'm your girl. <laughs> okay, and I'll answer more of the best practices for landlording. So. Um, but let's do three more. So Maggie, take it away. All right. Um, here's a question from D. In Georgia, is it, manda is it mandatory to provide heat or AC? Mm. Uh, it's a hot I, state. Yeah. It is livable. <laughs> I can't. I can't tell you. I can't give you state-specific laws. So uh, what I will say, you, typically, a lot of states above the Mason-Dixon line, which is right down the middle of the United States. 
um, do require heat to a certain level. So the general rule is that generally nationwide, though, you do have to allow your place to reach 68 degrees or around there, depending on your county. Uh, if it drops below that, then it's considered uninhabitable because it's too cold. Uh, now, there's not often rules about too hot. Uh, when you get into states like Arizona or Southern California, you know, then then obviously it can get into the hundreds and it's very uncomfortable and dangerous. Uh, so you have to consider like if somebody's life is at risk or it's or it's uncomfortable for a child, like reasonably uncomfortable, then you really should be providing that service to make it not comfortable or not uncomfortable. So you should be providing air conditioning and, and things like that. So um, heat is uh, often not required, like heat per se, like a heater, but you do have to be able to have every room in the house reach a certain temperature, which is typically about 68 degrees. So that could mean you know, there's a space heater in the upper left quadrant of the house because that's where it gets cold, but the rest of the house is fine because you're in Georgia and it never really gets that cold. So uh, do your local research, do your county research, and see what it says. I, I can't specifically answer that question for you, but that's the premise. It has to be inhabitable, and that's typically 68 or higher as long as it's comfortable. Awesome. Here is a question from John. Uh, does smoking marijuana lo uh, laws fall into the same policy as smoking laws in a non-smoking Building. Yes. The short answer is yes. <laughs> so smoking is smoking. Uh, it's it's not what you're smoking that's the problem. It's that you're smoking. So uh, cigarette smoke, pot smoke, any kind of smoke will leave a residue on the walls. It will make the carpet smell. It will essentially damage the property. And that's the biggest thing. And uh, if you're actually lighting something on fire, that's a fire hazard too. So. Uh, it, it doesn't matter what it is. If it's no smoking, then then marijuana certainly fits into that. So if you have medicinal need for marijuana, or you you in states where you're allowed to use it, there are other ways to get it in your system than smoking. Um, so yes, you have to you still have to abide by the no smoking rules. And and even if you have a medical um, prescription to smoke marijuana, and that's the only way that you can get it. Uh, the landlord can still say, that's fine, but you can't do it on the property. So uh, smoking is not a uh, protected class. Awesome. Um, let's see. Sorry, I should have had one queued up it's for okay. you. Um, as a landlord, the lease on my property is coming to an end soon. How do you decide when to raise rent and how to best determine the rent increase amount? And that's from Jaytin. Okay. How to best determine the uh, rent increase? Yeah. Okay. That's a decision that's going to be case by case. So there's no easy equation for this. Like a lot of times landlords will try to assign an easy equation. They'll say like, oh, I just raised my rent with inflation. Well, in the last five years, inflation's only been like one and a half percent. So sometimes like that's not good enough. Uh, and, and the rental market will fluctuate differently than inflation. So uh, if you want to raise the rent on the same tenants, I would just say do a marginal increase like like one to three percent, and if you really need to, do five percent. Uh, but make sure you're within the state limits. So look up your state laws. Uh, what I actually personally like to do is, if I have a really good tenant that I don't want them to leave, and it's time to renew, I will use that as bait. So I will say, listen, I, I really want you to stay. I promise I will not raise the rent if you sign a new lease. And uh, that's my way to incentivize them. Now, it doesn't get me any extra money, but what happens is I get a really great tenant who saves me a lot of money in the long run, and they will eventually leave. My, most of my leases are anywhere from one to three years, or at least that's how long the tenancies end up being. And at the end of the three years, uh, I usually will raise the rent an absorbent amount to make up for the loss that I took for the three years that, that uh, I had them. So I kept a good tenant, long time, it was great. And then when they leave, I'll raise the rent like 10 or 15%. So I will actually make up the difference that way very quickly. Uh, and the new tenant, I'm, I have no obligation to keep the rent real low for that new tenant because it's a new tenant. So as long as I'm providing uh, an inhabitable place that at market rate or around market rate, it's um, it's fine. So that's what I do with raising the rent. That's how I figured it out. And I use, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I use Cozy's rent estimates to figure it out. Here's an example of one. Um, which tells me that my rent estimate for this property is about $1,000, 1020 So um, I, I typically know how far I can push it. 
All right, last question is from um, Lakita. Lakita, I'm sorry for mispronouncing your name there. Um, she asks, I have a tenant in Georgia that is not under a lease and was occupying the property when I purchased it. Okay. I want to serve the tenant a 60-day notice to quit. Will I be subject to squatter rights? You know, again, I don't know the actual squatter rights in that county. So uh, it does vary from state to state and county to county. So uh, typically they have to show proof that they've lived there for a decent amount of time and that they actually have the right to live there in some sort. Um, you know, when that right can be just because they've squatted, depending on the county laws. So um, I would actually proceed with uh, doing what you can to make them leave voluntarily. Now, you, you aren't allowed to do horrible things to them or, you know, be just a bad person, but you, you certainly can motivate them. So what that means is if it were my squatter, I would say, um, you know, well, and this is prefaced if, if I allowed them to live there in the first place. Uh, but if they were just there, I would say, listen, you know, uh, you need to move. You don't have the right to live here. You don't have a lease. You don't have anything. And if you don't move, I'd call the cops. You know, uh, the cops will likely tell me you can't do that. You know, like we'll show up, but like we can't do that. Uh, we can't just pull them out. And uh, they're right. So, but what it might do is it might motivate the tenant to leave if they hear the cops are coming. Um, now, if they don't leave and they still argue with the cops, they still argue with me, then I would go and I'd get an eviction action against them. So I would go to court, file the paperwork. Yeah, it takes time, it's expensive, but it gets them out. Um, if you don't want to go through that, you can always offer something called cash for keys. So if they have keys because you've allowed them to live there, but their lease is up and they aren't moving, you go to them and you say, Hey, listen, I don't like this situation, but if you if you move out and keep the you know clean up the place by Friday, I'll give you four hundred dollars, like cash. So I'll look at the place, I'll check it out, you know, as we're departing, like I'll change the locks and I'll give you four hundred bucks. And if they need money, and oftentimes if they're squatting in a place, it's because they need money. Uh, they will often take that, and you would have saved yourself a lot of time and hassle, and and more importantly you can quickly get somebody out and quickly get a new person in. And uh, depending on how much money you're offering, they might actually uh, you know, not do any damage to the property or actually maybe they'll clean the carpets or something like that. So uh, that's what I would do. Uh, but check your state laws if you're really interested to know what the squatter's rights are and, and what is defined as a squatter because that does, that does change too. So I think that's it. Uh, any, any last questions or we're good? Um, I think that's it. Um, okay. There's a few questions that we'll follow up by email. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we've had a couple people ask about how to get in touch with Cozy Support and if we're going to be sending a recording. Ah, gotcha. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, yes, we did record this. We will clean it up a bit and then uh, send it out. So if you register for the webinar and you're here, you'll, we have your email address and we will let you know. So just look for that in the next 24 to 48 hours. We'll give you a link to it and you can watch it again. Uh, again, we will, we will look at the questions, but please do, if you have an urgent question, that I didn't answer, please email us. Uh, my email address is lucas at landlordology.com and I'll, I'll do my best to try to answer. Uh, if you do want to contact Cozy Support and you want to walk through that, again, Cozy is completely free, so you've got nothing to lose by trying it. Uh, it's how I manage my businesses and it works great. It saves me about 30, I think it was $34,000 a year is what I saved in 2016 by not using a property manager. Um, and doing it myself. So you can contact Cozy Support at uh, support at cozy.co or we have some uh, a page with a bunch of FAQs and help docs which I have right here under helpdocs.cozy.co. Um, you'll see the URL at the top there and you can look through on lots of articles and screenshots on how Cozy works and even some videos that Maggie's recorded to walk you through the process. So uh, that's it. So thanks everyone for, for uh, coming and, uh, and we had a lot of people show up today and I appreciate your time. Good luck with your, uh, with your rental business and we're here to help and, and I'm glad you can walk through this with us. So thanks again. Bye everyone. Bye.